you haven't been here before, we are a movement incubator for working class and marginalized communities. We have, we're building our educational and cultural programming, and um, we, will, we invite you to check out our calendar online and in our print brochures, um, and please do keep coming on back. I am so excited about this discussion and this book talk today. We are so grateful that Max Elbaum was able to come to New York City to talk about his incredible book, Revolution in the Air, uh, 60s Radicals and Turn to Lenin, Mao, Mao, and Che. Movement incubator for working this is an Mao. extremely important and uh, very you know, well-documented moment in U.S. history, um, taking us back to the state of the U.S. left in the 1970s. It's really important for us to dig deep into this era and to be able to learn from the lessons uh, of this time. And we're so uh, lucky to have these three amazing, uh, experienced, and wise uh, people here with us today to discuss and share their knowledge and their wisdom. I'm not able to do justice with short, uh, with short introductions, but I will do my best. I'm going to give brief introductions, and then you can hear directly from Max, Willie, and Waistline. Um, so Max is, has been involved in peace, anti-racist, and radical movements since joining the Students for a Democratic Society in Madison, Wisconsin in the 1960s. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, he was active in then widespread efforts to build a new U.S. Revolutionary Party as a leader of one of the main organizations in the new communist movement. In the 1990s, he was the editor of Crossroads, a magazine featuring dialogue and debate among socialists and revolutionaries from different radical political traditions. He is currently an editor of Organizing Upgrade. Willie is a, uh, has 50 years of experience educating and organizing amongst the poor and dispossessed, including working as a lead organizer with the United Steelworkers, as an educator and organizer with the National Union of the Homeless, and as well as many other networks. He is the author of numerous books, articles, and pamphlets, including Pedagogy of the Poor, A New and Unsettling Force, Reigniting Reverend, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's Poor, poor uh, Five Main Ingredients and the Six Panther Peas. Willie presently serves as the Poverty Initiative Scholar in Residence and Co Coordinator of Poverty Scholarship and Leadership Development for the Cairo Center. And finally, Daryl Waistline Mitchell is a founding member of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, a former union rep of the UAW, and a founding member of the Communist Labor Party. He is the author of the pamphlet Detroit, A History of Struggle, A Vision of the Future, and the book Marx's Glossary, Expanded Edition. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Max, and I hope you all enjoy the discussion. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do in these opening remarks is... What I'm going to try to do in these opening remarks is first talk a little bit about uh, the 1960s and try to convey the flavor of that period, why so many people became revolutionaries out of the movements of the 1960s. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what's covered in my book. Uh, I'm going to offer a few opinions about what we did right and what we did wrong and wrap up with a few comments about the situation today and what any of this might mean for current politics. The 1960s were a very complicated uh, time. And one side of the 1960s experience uh, was a lot of uh, pain and suffering. Uh, this was the era, uh, a generation that was traumatized by the Cuban Missile Crisis and the threat of nuclear war. It was the era of political assassinations. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, two Kennedys, Fred Hampton, leader of the Black Panther Party in Chicago. It was the era of violence unleashed upon peaceful civil rights protesters. And it was the period of the Vietnam War, which, unlike today, uh, was broadcast into every home every night on television. And with two million people from the United States deployed to Vietnam at one time or another, Every single person in the country at that time knew somebody who had gone to Vietnam if we didn't go ourselves, which meant we knew somebody who came back wounded psychologically or physically, 
or came back in a body bag. And I can still remember watching on television, seeing live that US officer saying, we had to burn down the village in order to save it. So there was a lot going on that was extremely difficult and painful. Uh, but that was not dominant. It was a period of incredible hope and optimism. This was a period that led to important victories that those of us who participated in the movements at that time felt we had contributed to and taken part in. So our generation is the generation that saw those southern governors standing at the university gates saying segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Two years later, Jim Crow is overthrown with the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, the Civil Rights Act in 1964, and the Black Freedom Movement didn't stop, but accelerated and became more radical and more militant. In Vietnam, even though the amount of US ordinance dropped on Vietnam was greater than that dropped on all theaters in World War II, and the country was threatened with genocide, a poor peasant country was actually winning against the most powerful military machine that the world had ever seen. Now today, the generation today, the US never wins any wars. These wars just keep going on. Afghanistan, Iraq, US never wins. But put yourself in the place in the 1960s. We had been brought up to believe that the US was not only a force for good in the world, but that it was invincible, that it had, lost, it had never mm -hmm. lost a war. And it was an ideological earthquake mm -hmm. for our generation to see the United States being defeated in Vietnam. And it was not just Vietnam. The entire third world was ablaze, what we then called the third world today, the global south, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. And even in the industrialized Western countries, it, there was a member of my SDS chapter who spent 1968 in France. And I remember when she came back in June 1968, she gave a report to our chapter about the night of the barricades in Paris, when students on the barricades and 10 million workers on strike almost overthrew a government right in the heart of Western Europe. And we began to see in the late 1960s like that, uh, the stirrings of coming out of the movements of the 1960s, the black freedom movement, the other freedom movements of the time, and the anti-war movement, a new militancy stirring in the working class. And we thought that that, har that was a harbinger of the future in the United States, not just of what had happened in France. And especially for those in the Midwest, I'm, I was in Milwaukee at the time, the influence of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit. Detroit was our Petrograd. This was going to be the, <laughs> the center of the Soviets. And I just want to say it's a tremendous pleasure for me. Wasteline and I have corresponded for the last yeah. 10 years. Wasteline was one of the people who built the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, but it's the first time we've met in person. Oh, wow. And it's a really moving event for me to be personally to connect with you today. So thank you very much. Those are the kinds of experiences that made so many of us revolutionaries in the 1960s, those who went through that personally and those who uh, witnessed it. And I can remember especially March 31st, 1968, when Lyndon Johnson said, I will not seek my, my party's nomination for the presidency, and he opened up peace talks with the Vietnamese. Every single person who had protested the war felt we had personally taken part in overthrowing a president of the United States, not through the cruel means of assassination, but through mass political action. It's no wonder that out of experiences like that, we felt we were part of a surge, a global surge for freedom that was creating a new world for all. It was rooted in those that France Fanon called the wretched of the earth, mm -hmm. the most dispossessed, the most marginalized, yes, yes. but it embraced everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody with a conscience, everybody who participated had a contribution to make. And most of tonight, 
I think we're going to be talking about how difficult it is on the ground to move from revolutionary ideas in the air to actual political power on the ground. But I want to say at the beginning that the lodestar of a better world for all is still my lodestar, and it's the vantage point from which revolution in the air is written. Now, especially after the murder, the assassination of Martin Luther King, April 4th, 1968, this was, a, the, of all the moments of that period, this was the moment more than any other single moment that convinced thousands of people that the U.S. socioeconomic system could not be reformed. We needed revolutionary change if we were going to win racial equality, peace, liberation for all. So thousands of people in the years immediately after 1968 set out in search of a strategy, an ideology, a way of thinking, a way of acting that would bring that revolution about. And naturally, we were influenced by the shape of the global left at the time, and particularly by those movements that were seemed to be on the front lines of the struggle against Western imperialism and white supremacy, the national liberation movements in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. Uh, they identified with Marxism-Leninism. They were rooted in the third world, and many of us gravitated toward those politics. And I'm just going to read one quick section from my book that talks about the pole of attraction that though that was for us. Inspired by the dynamic liberation movements that threatened to besiege Washington with two, three, many Vietnams, many decided that a third world oriented version of Marxism was the key to building a powerful left here. That perspective put opposition to racism and military interventionism front and center. It riveted attention on the intersection of economic exploitation and racial oppression, pointing young activists toward the most disadvantaged sectors of the working class. It linked aspiring US revolutionaries to the parties and leaders who were proving that the power of the people were greater than the man's technology. The Vietnamese and Chinese communist parties, Amakar Cabral and the Marxist-led revolutionary movements in Africa, Che, Fidel, and the Cuban Revolution. Third world Marxism promised the break with Eurocentric models of social change and pointed a way toward building a multiracial movement out of a badly segregated US left. Within those ranks, a determined contingent set out to build tight-knit cadre organizations based on Marxism-Leninism. We believed that new upsurges lay just ahead and that it was urgent to prepare a united and militant vanguard so that the revolutionary potential glimpsed in the 1960s could be realized the next time around. Now this current on the left, the new communist movement, was not the only one that attracted radicals from the 60s. Every, every current on the left grew. Social democracy, anarchism, revolutionary nationalism, feminism, different versions of Marxism. But this was the current that had the most dynamism it attracted the uh, plurality of those who were committed to rooting themselves in the working class and building a united revolutionary movement. And the bulk of chapters in my book trace the history of this current, from its explosive initiative in the early 1970s, coming out of the late 60s, to the period of the late 80s and early 90s, when as a coherent political trend, it pretty much lost its dynamism. Many of its organizations had collapsed. Uh, it details the theoretical frameworks and strategies of the different organizations, the one that I was in, the Line of March, the group that uh, Waistline uh, was a founding member of the Communist Labor Party and a number of the other organizations. Uh, it talks about our work, the work of the different groups in the labor movement, in the anti-racist movement, in the women's movement, the LGBTQ movements. It talks about the structures of our organizations, the ways in which they were and weren't democratic. Uh, it talks about the political culture, and it talks about some of the ideological disputes within the movement mm -hmm. that prevented all of us from being in the same party at that time. The purpose of the book is to provide a resource 
It's to lay out that history for people to draw your own conclusions about what it all means. Those of us who went through that experience don't all agree on the balance sheet, and certainly people who have studied that experience don't all agree on the balance sheet. Um, but if you want to access all that, I'm afraid you have to buy the book. I'm not going to inflict all those details on you tonight. Uh, obviously, uh, in the course of living through that experience and then also writing about it, I've formed some opinions of my own about what it means, and I, I am going to inflict those on you for the next five or eight minutes. So I want to pick out one thing that I think we made a mistake on and what's an important lesson from that and a couple things where I think we got things right. Um, we misassessed the historical moment we were in. I think this was our most costly error. Uh, it led us to adopt strategies and tactics that were out of sync with where history was going at that time, and it separated us a little too much from those constituencies that we thought were crucial to revolutionary change in the United States. Uh, we had come of age in the 1960s, a period of tremendous upsurge and rapid change. Uh, we maybe overgeneralized a little bit from that experience. We weren't completely naive. We didn't think that it was just going to be a straight shot from the 1960s to revolution. But our worldview was that the 60s were our 1905, our dress rehearsal for the 1917 revolution in the United States. That the, after a period of ebb and decline in the mass movements, there would be another upsurge that would be further to the left, more rooted in the working class than the 60s movements, and would provide a leap toward more revolutionary change. Now, that was actually a very plausible perspective from about 1968 until the very early 70s, till Wounded Knee, and until the 1974 economic crisis, recession, uh, the beginnings of deindustrialization, which saw young workers and black workers being the most militant sections of the working class, many coming back from Vietnam, kicked out of their jobs. Uh, and the ruling class was able, at that point, to start to regroup and launch a counteroffensive based upon fanning racism, homophobia, anti-feminism, demonizing peoples in the third world, using the oil crisis especially to target the Arab world uh, with the collaboration of the strong Zionist influence in American politics at that time to launch a global counter-revolution against all the gains of the 60s at home and the gains of the national liberation movements and those countries that had broken with capitalism, the socialist camp. There was a global counter-revolution. And through the early and mid-70s, it, it started to become uh, clear that that had gained the initiative, what Mike Davis calls in his, uh, one of his works, the Watts Riot of the Middle Class as the haves launched that counteroffensive. And we weren't able to readjust to that carefully enough. And this was a costly mistake because it meant that some of our differences, we exaggerated what they meant. Things that might have been crucial differences if you're approaching a revolutionary situation don't have the same weight if you're in for a long defensive period. And the masses of people, many of those people, they turn to policy fights, electoral fights, and we had thought that those things were sort of historically obsolete. But uh, a certain revolutionary, uh, Lenin, said that what's obsolete for us isn't necessarily obsolete for the masses. So we went one way, but 1980 didn't bring us another revolutionary upsurge. It brought us Ronald Reagan and part of the whole counter-revolutionary motion. Cup lesson there, we need to assess the historical moment where the economy is, the underlying forces, and where the consciousness of the masses of people are, and adjust our work accordingly. <coughs> A couple things about some important strengths and why many of us uh, are still here fighting, and even if we're not in the same organizations we were then, we've patched up our differences. Uh, we might still disagree about things, but it's not in the same fashion. 
and we're still here uh, fighting and trying to make revolutionary change. This section of the movement was absolutely committed to immersing itself in the working class. Many people came from the working class, came out of Watts, came out of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, came out of the fact that it was the first generation where a lot of working class kids went to college with a psychology of giving back to the community, people who led struggles for ethnic studies, black studies, women's studies, all those schools across the country in the late 60s. So many were from the working class, but many were from the middle classes, and a lot of those people were absolutely dedicated to moving into working class communities, getting jobs, sharing the conditions of the working class, and organizing in the working class. And hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who are still involved in struggles in labor, in community struggles, come out of that period of dedication to sinking roots in the working class, out of belief that the working class was the agent of revolutionary change. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have a base in the working class, you were floating. We also, this section of the movement, oriented itself to some of the key particularities of the US, in particularly the fact that this is a country built on genocide of the native population and enslavement of people of African descent. Now today, there's mainstream scholarship that talks about the role of black labor in building not just US capitalism, but global capitalism. There's books out there like The Half Has Never Been Told and books like uh, Empire of Cotton that make that case in the mainstream academia. But in the 1960s, there was nothing in mainstream academia making these points. It was W.E.B. Du Bois and the section of the movement that we came out of and a few other parts of the left that focused on the central role of black labor and what that meant, and also the central role of the black freedom movement because of where it was positioned in driving forward change for everyone. First reconstruction after the Civil War is uh, which Du Bois called the dictatorship of the proletariat, the general strike that won the Civil War. Those were the most progressive state governments for anyone people of all races and nationalities ever on US soil. And we lived through Second Reconstruction, which it was the civil rights movement that broke the back of McCarthyism and op gave the power punch behind the anti-Vietnam War movement and Martin Luther King's speech in uh, breaking the silence and the rebellion of black GIs and other GIs on the ground in Vietnam when they were fragging their officers instead of fighting the Viet Cong. Uh, and open the door for all those other movements of the 60s. It's no accident that the women's movement, the lesbian gay movement, they modeled themselves on the liberation movements and oriented toward the, those freedom movements. Uh, and it's a reason why the Poor People's Campaign that Reverend Barber has re leading today, the new Poor People's Campaign, picking up on what Martin Luther King was involved in at the end of his life, the Poor People's Campaign, uh, and the movement against, in King's day, the three great evils of racism, militarism, and extreme materialism, which creates the incredible polarization between wealth and poverty, and Reverend Barber and the new Poor People's Movement, which I think Willie is very involved in, has added environmental protection and the fight against climate change, and that resonates. The deep roots in US history, first reconstruction, second reconstruction, and third reconstruction as a path toward a socialist future. Uh, that was a great strength. Those were strengths of our movement and need to be carried over in certain ways, uh, into new conditions, of course, into the next period. A um, Couple things about the current moment. So, um, you know, just pick up the newspaper today, the, any day, the attacks on the census, the shooting in the San Diego, the same person who tried to burn down a Muslim mosque shoots up a synagogue, uh, census questionnaire, the Supreme Court is going to rule that the immigration question can be asked. You know, the whole, the whole thing coming from the block behind the Trump administration. It's a white, the glue is white nationalism. 
Uh, that's the centerpiece of the attack. Uh, building a coalition, a cross-class coalition, a reactionary coalition. Uh, it's a myth that that coalition's core base is the white working class. There are certainly many white workers who are in it, but its core base is the white middle classes, the middle strata, and the right-wing billionaires, and the fossil fuel industry and military industrial complex who are driving that. And they have an openly fascist current on, the, on their edge, which they defend. The people who are in 8chan, where this guy got uh, radicalized, the one who shot up the synagogue in San Diego. Um, so we have to be sober-minded about that, and it's part of a global rise of right-wing authoritarianism based on xenophobia, Islamophobia, racism, and so on. The good news is the majority of people in this country are against that, and there's a surging social justice movement around going in all sectors of society, people involved in immigrant rights, climate change, Me Too, uh, labor movements, anti-racist movements, all these movements, which is the driving energy of the broad movement against Donald Trump. Now, of course, there's people in the anti-Trump front, the corporate Democrats, who think that Trump is bad because he's not a good guardian of the empire that has served them very well. But that's not the driving force out there. The driving force are those who see Trump as an immediate main obstacle to getting further and not going back to the status quo, but giving toward a third reconstruction kind of perspective, whether it's used that terminology or not. That's the massive driving force of this. And I want to just go back and talk a little bit about the, what it will take to win that fight, to oust the immediate main danger, and to solidify a left current that can then move to a higher stage of struggle and more advance. There have been three great periods of social advance in US history. The movement from abolitionism through reconstruction, the 1930s, the organization of mass production industry and progressive politics holding off a fascist solution to the depression, and second reconstruction of the 1960s aimed at ending the Vietnam War and overturning Jim Crow. And each of those three had certain common elements. The first one is they took place at a period of big changes in the underlying political economy and the balance of global power. The second one is that they were mass movements making a hell of a lot of trouble from below, causing all kinds of trouble with picket lines, demonstrations, civil disobedience, all kinds of motion from the bottom. The third one, is they opened up, that, that combination to open up a split in the ruling class. Again, uh, Lenin, it's a strategic reserve, splits in the enemy camp, our strategic reserve. It's also, if you just grow up on the playground, you don't fight all your enemies at once. You try to get them to fight each other a little bit. And then the last thing is use of all the tactics, everything from electoral to mass action, and uh, in our period, armed self-defense, and in the Civil War, armed, armed struggle. So all those elements combine. And those elements were all necessary to overturn the immediate mass struggle of that period. Um, the challenge was, uh, the second challenge, was that after the slaveocracy was defeated, after uh, a fascist solution in the 30s was held off, and after Second Reconstruction overturned Jim Crow and ended the Vietnam War, that coalition breaks up and the ruling class wing was able to push back and marginalize the left. Through Ku Klux Klan terror and black disenfranchisement after Reconstruction, McCarthyism after World War II, and we're living through the backlash, the 45-year backlash against the gains of the 1960s. So we have a two-fold challenge. We have to find a way to defeat the white nationalist bloc that now has a grip on power but we have to do it in a way that we come out of it with enough strength that we cannot be marginalized. 
that the social justice forces, those for peace, economic equality, sustainable planet, have enough of a grip on political power, have enough institutional strength, have enough independent organizational initiative, and have a strong enough base in the working class that we can hold some initiative and move it to a more advanced stage of struggle after that instead of being pushed back. And for that, you also need a revolutionary section mm -hmm. of the social justice front. And that's why it's so encouraging that so many people, especially young people, are turning to revolutionary politics, looking back at history, trying to figure out what worked, what didn't work, and examining the current moment. The job of people of our generation is to share our experience, mm -hmm. our opinions, for people to take them or leave them, take what you think is useful, leave the rest, and for us to get in behind you and let's hope together we can move history another notch forward. Okay. okay, I guess I'm up. Um, first of all, I have to mention a couple of things before I get started. Uh, the first thing is uh, thank you for coming out. I'm deeply grateful that I've had opportunity to be part of this program. You know, what made it possible is the People's Educational Program. I became involved with them because I wanted to have an opportunity to pass on a body of knowledge and information to a new generation about how our country thinks, behaves, and tick. And People's Educational Project, it gives me that opportunity. There are some people I just like to mention because they have been very kind to me. You already saw Leanne. She has been just wonderful in pulling together an educational program here. Kevin has personally uh, helped get me here. He's helped acclimate me to my circumstances. Then you have the people running the place like Manolo and uh, Brother David. I'd just like to give them a kind shout out because I absolutely love this space. I remember when it was being planned. It wasn't here a year ago. So when I come up and see it, it's just wonderful and it's magnificent because it gives us a place and an opportunity to talk about things. Um, Max mentioned that we have communicated actually on and off for probably a couple of decades, so I'm just elated that I had an opportunity to meet him in the flesh and stuff. When you look at Revolution in the Air, and it is a book worth owning, his introduction begins with the first four months in 1968, and it begins in 1968 because it was a huge year of change. You know, one of the things that happened in 1968 was a strike in Detroit, Michigan that happened May 1968 at an old Chrysler plant, the Dodge Main plant. And it was the kind of strike that began to change what was taking place in America. To understand it, though, I want to jump back and forth through history because, no, I want to say something else first. The reason we do this is because we are looking to educate people. Mm -hmm. We are fighting for the life of the mind. Mm -hmm. We are not looking for disgruntled, discontent people. We are looking for people who have the capacity to think, who have the ability to create a vision for people in this country that's worth fighting for. The reason that's important, because we're undergoing this tremendous activity that's starting to take place. Ever since Trump got elected, time has sped up. All of us can feel it, right? And what happened was something so amazing. One day after Trump was inaugurated, one of the biggest demonstrations in the history of America took place, organized and led predominantly by women. And I'm mentioning this because the hardest thing in life to do is to find your moment in history. It took us 30, 40 years to figure out how to find our moment in history. Now, the reason we study and read things and what drove us to Marxism, right, we wanted to make sense of the world we live in. On that note, I want to go back and just run through some aspects of my life so we know who each other are and what it is that motivate us. Growing up, all I wanted to do was be a good boy. I honestly wanted to be good, and I wanted to do the right thing because I was raised by a couple of parents who had a certain kind of morality. And they 
taught us that we should oppose evil, that we should stand up for right because that's how human beings lived. So when I grew up, I grew with the, up with that morality with a sense of fairness that was kind of built into us. And being in Detroit back then, it was an epicenter of this incredible movement that was taking place. It's hard to tell now, but in the past century, Detroit was to Michigan and America what Silicon Valley is to California and America today. It's hard to see it, but the automobile industry was the classical home of technological innovation. And because of that, we stayed at the cutting edge of a very powerful movement. The world I'm from is not your world. Mm -hmm. I am not of your world. I am of a world that was birthed on the basis of the Industrial Revolution, the last phase of it, specifically a period of history we call Fordism. Fordism as a system, it changed life in America and around the world. Henry Ford revolutionized how production took place in this country. And because of that, a factory system was created that amalgamated thousands of people together under one roof. That amalgamation made it possible for us to develop a different kind of collective way of living. People who did not like each other, after you work with the same person year after year on the assembly line, you get to know who they are, who their family is, and you start bonding together a certain way. So I grew up under conditions where my reality was what can be described as industrial reality. We had industrial time frames, and we had a very different way of looking at things. By the time I was a teenager, the social movement inside of the country was heating up. For me, 1968 was important because a year earlier, 1967 Detroit, July, was one of the greatest uprisings to take place in this country. Mm -hmm. And the uprising changed the architecture of the country, but I want to talk about it a little bit before I advance forward. What happened was you had a group of people who were hanging out at what they call a blind pig. In Detroit, we call them an after-hour joint. When you get off of work, if you had a little money and stuff, you would go take you a shower, you would get your girl or whoever you was with, and you would go to the after-hours club, right, where they sold liquor after hours, and you would come in. Anyway, one weekend, the police decided to bust this after-hour joint, and it was the catalyst that caused the rebellion. I want to look at it because you have to understand that the only people who could attend and patronize the after-hour joint is people with money. Because you had to be able to afford the food, the drink, the dance. And you always had a little gambling in the back. And I'm saying that because what incited the rebellion in Detroit was attacking the better paid sections of the working class. When we think about these rebellions and riots, for different reasons, we conjure this picture of deep poverty. And it's, it's not like that. And we need to catch up with who we are and what kind of country we live in. Because from my point of view, actually from the point of view of this, it looked like a meeting of old men, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, that's what we are. But we're reaching a point in our country that's pretty exciting and stuff. Now, in 1968, we had what was called a drum strike, right? It took place in a Dodge main plant. At this Dodge main plant, it was this huge structure that held 10,000 people making Dodge automobiles. The work was hot, dirty, and dangerous, but we were the highest paid industrial workers in the world. And I'm saying that because our country went through a curve of development, right, where you could actually make a living in this country. I remember as a young man being able to make a living. It's important because my dad worked for Ford Motor Company. When he passed, he had 38 years seniority at Ford Rouge, and he was one of the earlier black laborers that was able to work his way into skilled trades. Mm -hmm. He died an electrician and stuff. So when I come up, I come up under that kind of system where I was trained not only in a household, but even in school. The world we lived in was profoundly industrial. In school, they taught us how to acclimate ourselves to this industrial system. The civil rights movement 
it had an impact in Detroit. And because we were highly organized, we were able to do things in Detroit that you couldn't do in most places. You know, the Detroit 67 riot, it was significant because we have SWAT teams today in these highly military police force, but that back then we didn't. Back then, the rebellion in Detroit, what it did is cause the collapse of the police departments around the country yeah. because it became evident that the way they were set up, they could no longer control this moving section of the working class. It was under those conditions that I was able to develop my consciousness about the world around me and stuff. I was 15, actually, when I decided to join the revolutionary movement in a serious way. You know, at 16, I got my first job in automobile industry, working for General Motors against my parents' permission. They wanted all of us to go to school, get degrees, become accomplished, you know, doctors, lawyers, and things like that. But I knew at 16 that I could go into the factory and make a man's wage and marry the girl I always loved. And you know, I didn't quite do that, but <laughs> you know what I mean? But I ended up in the factory and I ended up working for Chrysler, which afforded me an opportunity to uh, make a man's wage and have a decent living. Let me back up a little bit. I want to talk about some of the things in this book also. Um, one of the things, I'm gonna jump in that back and forth. One of the things I like about the book is, and everybody should have their own copy, you should. It's like an encyclopedia of what happened. It instructs you on who did what. I forget what chapter it is it's in, but Max talked about uh, how one of the distinguishing characteristics of this period was the energy that people had, right? Because we come out of a time frame of optimism, totally different from today. You knew that you could make a living in this country. You knew you could carve yourself out another way of life. You knew you could leave home, right? And didn't have to live up under your parents. So we had a different way of viewing things that was deeply optimistic. We honestly believed in our ability to cause and effect change. And that gave us a different sense and a different purpose. We had people like Muhammad Ali, who literally in front of the world refused to fight. And we had in Detroit, Motown music, right? We had this whole new culture that was taking shape, that was based on the industrial system that made it so that we were able to accomplish things beyond our imagination, right? We, we never felt like we was just single individuals. But when Max come out with his book back in 1901, um, I looked at it and today I feel a lot different about it. I can respect it a lot more nowadays because I, I, I can understand, well, you get older, you become kinder, right? You become more patient, you become more forgiving. That way when you go to hell, <laughs> <laughs> you might have a chance, right? You just might, okay. But no, it's, it's honestly an encyclopedia of events that happen and it tells you the different organizations that were in play. And if you look at them, what you had in motion was a couple of hundred thousand people who wanted to make sense of the world in which they live and who dedicated their lives to studying and teaching and fighting to make the world a better place. I think we have reached a point in time in this country where that can happen again, but only at a different level. Let me jump back to 1968. We had this Dodge main strike, right, that involved 10,000 workers and it was, they called it a wildcat strike, right? A wildcat strike is an unauthorized strike on the part of the workforce. It was two strikes in 1968. In most books, they tell you about the second strike, which was kind of inaugurated by a group of black workers. But the first strike wasn't. The one they never talk about, it was inaugurated by Polish workers. It was a woman in the plant, a Polish woman, right, who had enough and she refused to work, and everybody supported her. Dodge Main, you have to understand, was in a city adjacent to Detroit called Hamtramck. Hamtramck, Pollockville, right? Uh, is that derogatory? Yeah. Okay, well, give me another word. Teach me. Uh, Pol well, what do I call it? Poland. 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 Poland.
Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. Like, you know, correct me. I'm an old man. <laughs> no, no, I'm, you know, I'll, 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 I'll give. Don't beat me. You know. <laughs> no, but the first strike, which was significant, was inaugurated by a woman, right? And that first strike is what taught people how to come together and how to go on strike. These factories now were entire cities. They weren't just small shops like we have nowadays. In, the, in these factories, you could get anything you needed because they operated literally like little cities and stuff. So you had this city within a city. And on Friday, you had like, see, the society was structured different. On Fridays, you would have these Brink trucks that would come up to the factory. That, I see you shaking your head. That's how you would cash your check. And the women would be lined up because they would tr be trying to get to the paycheck before the husband ended up giving the money to the man in the tavern, right? <laughs> and, and well, that's been part of the whole struggle uh, that women have waged since the, what, since before, the, after the Civil War, the fight over the paycheck, right? You know, the fight against the man in the tavern, you know. But you had these people who were conditioned this way. So when this strike exploded, everybody in the city understood something was happening very different. And before we knew it, we had people coming from plants around the city demanding that we help them and set up an organization. Now, the reason this organization was set up by black workers was that when you have, Max mentioned some of the legislation in the 60s. The way America is set up is very complicated. When you pass a new law, there's it, no way for it to take effect until somebody fight to implement the law and that compels a movement of the judiciary where, and the court system where they have to set up things so that policy can be implemented and then you have a system to check on the policy. So this movement that's taking place is compelling all these corresponding changes within government and stuff. And we didn't know any of this. We're trying to learn how to navigate it. But the 1968 drum strike, it inaugurated what would become the last great strike wave in American history. It ran from roughly 1968 to 1974. The problem is that when you're in the middle of a strike wave, you cannot tell when it peaked until after the fact, right? So what happened was, with the civil rights movement going, 68 was critical, Stokely Carmichael raised the slogan of black power, and black power was a slogan that became an electoral movement. Right? In Detroit, that meant electing our first black mayor, Coleman Young. What was different about Detroit was after we elected Coleman Young, we began to elect Marxists and communists to office. And it was the only place that this happened in Detroit. Now, the definitive book on that is called Detroit, I Do Mind Dying. You might be able to find a PDF on, on, online if you search good. But it describes this process that took place in Detroit. What I'm trying to get to is how these social movements, a catalyst uh, occur, mm -hmm. and people behavior start changing, right, in the most unexpected ways. Before 67, when you told people you were being harassed by the police, the first thing they would ask you, well, what did you do? Well, how come the police bothering you? After 67 and 68, when you talked about being harassed by the police, everybody cursed the police because they begin to understand their role differently. And I'm beginning to see that here today. See, we are experiencing a certain point in history where there's a continuum. From my point of view, things shifted in 2012, September 19th, with the Occupy movement. Then the next major shift was Trayvon Martin, right? And what I noticed about Trayvon Martin was something I've never seen before in America. I'm at home watching some of this movement take place on television, and I can't help but notice that the majority of demonstrations are white. And I said, this is extremely interesting. Now, they don't show things like that on television anymore. But when they first exploded, the news would cover them in a way where you could actually see what was taking place. Trayvon Martin, for some reason I can't totally account for, it caused a shift in the country. Then you had the incident in New, here in New York with Eric Garner. Mm -hmm. 
Then you had Mike Brown and Ferguson, right? So you have this escalation that's taking place that led up to ultimately Donald Trump and the next day all hell broke loose with one of the biggest demonstrations in American history. Now, my point is that we are beginning to understand where we are in history. In the 60s and 70s, we simply did not know because we had not been through that process before. Where we are in history is at a point where we can affect the thinking of this country in a way that's fundamentally different from anything that has happened since the Civil War, right? What I do is go back and try to look at the elements of American history. Abraham Lincoln, Civil War, he had something to do that was incredible. He had to try to convince the American people to oppose slavery when they didn't. See, in our country, like, I mean, one, we're stupid, right? You know, we just have a dumb country. And there's reasons for that. No, well, we don't have to remain stupid, that's the point. We can learn, we can become educated. But Abraham Lincoln had to try to deal with a working class that was not against slavery. They was not against slavery, but they was against the slaves, right? They was not against slavery, but they was against the slaves in the same way that when Occupy Wall Street broke out, everybody was against the banks, but not against the financial system, mm -hmm. right? Because you have the formation of consciousness, right? Abraham Lincoln had to do things in such a way where the border states, states would not be driven into the arms of the Confederacy. And I think we have to look at things like that. How can we do things where we just don't drive people away from us, right? Because we're at a point in time now where if we can figure out how to come together and network and incubate a new movement, which is why this place is here, we will be able to affect the destiny of this country. And I don't say that lightly. Is my time up? It's about up. OK. Uh, you, I can come back. <laughs> you know what I'm talking no, about? You, no, no, you, you OK, you, well, I'll go keep ahead. going a little bit. But, but No, but I'm saying it because I want to capture like uh, our moment in history where we're yeah, at, yeah. why this place exists. Yeah, go on. See, it's a purpose behind this place. It has been thought out, right? And we know this time around that we have to do things in a way where we figure out a new vision for our country. And I'm not sure exactly what the vision should be, but it should be of a new society where every human being has an opportunity to contribute every day of their life. When we talk about things, when I talk about things like Marxism and communism, I'm not talking about pie in the sky. I'm talking about a world in which I can get up every day and contribute something to the betterment of humanity rather than me spend my life making $7.50, $8 an hour, minimum wage, where life is just hard and you never can reach a level of enlightenment. And I'm saying it like that because we in the world now, um, I mean, it didn't exist when I was here. Y'all don't understand how the young people, this is a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. It's another, it's another technological mm. regime. And my point is that when you change the technology mm. in a society, society is forced to reorganize itself around a new technology. That whole process is what's meant by social revolution. Social revolution is the process of organizing yourself around new means of production. I come out of Detroit, and the point about what was dynamic in Detroit was it represented the new means of production from the 1919 and 1920 on, so that the working class in that city would be at the front curve of history. We thought we could go into revolution because we didn't understand the dynamics of society. One thing we learned is that as long as a system is developing, it can be reformed. And it doesn't make sense at first, but what it means is that when the industrial workers fought for a better wage, they were able to get reform the system. When they fought for a pension, they were able to reform the system because the industrial system was still developing. Anytime you have a system still developing, no matter how hard you fight, you can't overthrow it. 
By overthrow it, I mean you overthrowing the political structures in society and you bringing somebody new to power who can carry out your will. The technological revolution means that the old system we lived mm -hmm. under has come to an end. Reform is no longer possible. Not because we become angry or revolutionary, but because the system itself can't be reformed. Reform is change in a system that doesn't change the property relations. That's something we had to learn. We couldn't get that from Lenin, although we read Lenin diligently. Right? We couldn't get it from Mao, and I read Mao diligently. It's something we had to discover. But my point is that we, had a, we have reached this juncture in history where the system can no longer be reformed. We're teetering whether or not the country is going to become just truly barbaric and fascistic, and it doesn't have to. However, we are required to do our part. Yes. Our part means learning how to network in a new way. Our part means, yes, getting a copy of Revolution on, in the Air, and you can find it online for free, but, you know, go on buy it. <laughs> you can find it online, but go on spend a few bucks. You know what I mean? And I, but in, in, in a few Help words, out, that's, out. you know what I'm saying, man? Because Max be starving, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, you, see out there, out, you see how thin he is. He be starving, man. But uh, the point is that we honestly can make a difference. Ten years ago, we couldn't. Today, we can make a material difference in how this country behaves, how it thinks. But the key is us learning how to develop a coherent vision yes. of a new society, of a new tomorrow. On those words, let me pass the ball to Willie, because we can get questions and jump back and forth. Yeah, OK, very good. Um, I, I'm trying to figure where to start and, and therefore stop. 1965. You know, I, I think I'll start there. But I, the first point I want to make is thanks, you guys, for listening and being here. And hopefully we can have a, a real discussion and not just me and Waistline and Max just up here running our mouth. Because I can run my mouth all day long. Y'all be in here leaving, come back, I'm still rapping. So, and I'm plotting myself, so I'm going to have to try to keep my remarks very short. But I want to make the point that in making change, you have to go against forces who has invested interest in the status quo. And you've got to know who they are and what their weakness is and what their strengths. And you've got to know what your strengths and what your weakness is. This is the heart of strategy. And strategy cannot be reduced to morality, where we're so... we're. We had oppressive Olympics during the 60s, where we were more oppressed than you, and you was more oppressed than me. All the different uh, uh, nationalities, national uh, uh, oppressed minorities in the country, we had this kind of running argument. No, it's not a morality question, although morality plays a very important part, but strategy is about who's going to kick whose ass. huh? And when you're having to fight, you've got to size up. What your, who your enemy is, what their strengths and weaknesses are, what is your strength and weaknesses, and concentrate your strength against their weak point. And you've got to develop a leadership and an intelligence to understand that. And your intelligence got to match the sophistication of the forces that we're up against. The people we're up against are no joke. They don't give two shits about our morality and how oppressed we are. They know it because they don't want oppressing us. What they give a shit about is our ability to organize and kick their ass. And the only way we're going to kick their ass is to outsmart them. That means we have to develop intelligence. I want people to reflect on this kind of discussion because these discussions come too far in between. They're like luxuries. We come out for the evening. This should be part, part and parcel of everything we do where we're reflecting on all our experience, assessing who we're up against, and so on and so forth. It is so important that we have this book written because it requires a period, a very important period in history, that if we can master and understand some of the salient aspects of that period, we can then understand this period. Hmm? It's kind of hard to completely assess this period unless we understand that period and learn from that period what we can use to deal with this period. 
It is so important that we have a correct estimate of the situation. Martin Luther King pointed out that without an accurate diagnosis of the problem of the disease, you can't get an accurate prescription. If you think, think that what's coming at us is a teddy bear, when in fact it's a grizzly bear, you're in trouble. Huh? Because the set of taxes that you use in one case is different from the set of taxes in the other case. So assessing that period and getting an assessment of this period becomes very important. People hear what I'm trying to get at? So these discussions become very important, and discussions in a place like this become very important because there is no way we're going to defeat who we're up against, who benefit from our misery, unless we can match our sophistication with their sophistication, learning from our experiences, learning from history, and so on and so forth. One of the unfortunate things that I find in the work that I've been doing over the years is that a lot of the, the, uh, the young leaders that are coming up are coming out of this U.S. education system all the way up to the university more stupid than when they went in with regard to history, knowing what history, don't even know what happened yesterday, yet alone what happened in history, what lesson to draw from history, don't know the economy, there's no study of it, everything is romanticized. I got to do this, I'm going to do this today, and blah, 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 and that inevitably turned into a frustration and resignation. We have to have this tremendous intellectual inquiry and intercourse with each other to learn from each other to guide our practice if we're going to win. Hmm? There was a lot of romanticism in, this, in the period that I came up. I lived in that period. And I want to just touch very briefly on what shaped my life. There was a lot about it. I'm 70 years old now. And there was a lot about my life that made me who I am and what I, my commitments now today. I'm poor all my life. I worked all kinds of jobs, sundry jobs, you name it, I did it. Assembly jobs, uh, you know, dishwashing. Uh, I was homeless in the streets of Philadelphia for almost a year, so I've experienced it there. So I've been, been there, done that. Those have been the things that shaped me. But really, in terms of my history, uh, in terms of events that occurred during the 60s, uh, I would say that the Watts uprising was the thing that really shaped me. And I'm still a, a student of that period in terms of the conditions that gave rise to it, what happened, what was the different alignment of forces, what can we learn for, for, uh, uh, from that for today. Uh, August 11th, 1965, August 11th through the 16th, uh, August 16th, some 60,000 to 100,000 people hit the street in militant protests against inhumane conditions uh, that existed in Watts, California. Watts was one of the, if not the main or uh, uh, most, most impoverished area of, uh, of California. It was exactly, it was, a, it was a horrible area to live in, in terms of the ghetto, the black ghetto. Uh, it erupted. In the first two days, the uprising uh, uh, paralyzed the police force. And we had, you got to know, the police force in L.A. was pretty large. You had about anywhere a standing force of 6,000, 7,000 folks. But when you have that many people hitting the streets, that rendered Northern Board the police force. So they had to bring in big forces. But when they did have to concede the police, we did bonfires all over Watts, just happy that we, we kicked the police ass and turned the tables on their ass in terms of that fight that had been ongoing in our communities uh, uh, all, all that time. In, in the ghetto area. Uh, anyway, the point of it was that was a very, very uh, uh, igniting type, an explosive type situation, and it inaugurated a whole period of uprisings in the later 60s. Detroit, Newark, these areas, some 300 cities in total, and in, in after the, the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King, you had another round of 100-some cities going into blaze. This is, this is a very important eruption that happened during the 60s. It was really shaping. It shook my life. This was described by uh, the authorities as the, as the greatest anti-state uprising in the history of this country since the Civil War. It was a major, major development taking place. It was mainly concentrated, not in the whole of the so-called black community. The upper class black, you had you know, racial profiling because of just how race is so in deep in the culture and, and uh, history of this country. You had racial profiling, uh, profiling that was taking place in a place like Baldwin Hills, which was several hours away from Watts in LA, South Central LA. 
but you, but you didn't have the concentration of the kind of police repression and police brutality on a day-to-day -day basis. You had kids who were being stopped by the police and asked to, to show their identification card, and they were, when they went for their identification card, they were shot point blank range. You had 15-year-old kids. These are things that have gone through the community. 50-year-old women, uh, late, uh, girls, who were pulled in the back seat of a police car and raped. Huh? You had these kinds of encounters that was happening in the ghetto, the black ghetto. I'm talking about the, the, the lower classes of the blacks that erupted. This inaugurated, again, an uprising that uh, uh, has been described as the greatest anti-state uprising ever. Uh, it made tremendous impact on me, on my life, and kind of co committed me to what I'm doing today. Anytime you have police cars and, and tanks riding through your community, huh? Uh, that's got to wake you up. Uh, I was, uh, my friends, you know, would used to come out in front of my house and say, Willie, come on out here, man. We're having a lot of fun. It was like a festival, the uprising. And uh, my parents tried to keep me in. My father, though, he had to go to work. And so I, I went out. And the day I went out, uh, we were stopped by a helicopter huh, that was bought by the LAPD from the military that was used in Vietnam. We were, they came after us, we scattered our group, but then I was among the group that had to put their heads, that was caught with the, with the helicopter, with the machine gun out of the helicopters, telling us to lay down with our head face to, facing the cement. Hmm? Uh, these were the conditions that was happening. That would wake up the average person in terms of what in the hell is going on? Why am I in this situation? Now this situation was replicated or multiplied throughout the whole country in a certain period. The, my point is that today, today, you're talking about the conditions that exist in Watts. You're talking about upwards of 40 to 50 to 60 percent unemployment among, among the youth. Those conditions and the, the low wages that the, the, the blacks was, uh, black workers were facing at that time was conditions that, that are being replicated today not only in the black community or in the ghettos, but also in the Latino communities, the poor white slums, these areas throughout the country. We are dealing in explosive times. And the impulse of the struggles is to, to challenge not just an employer, but the whole state and governmental apparatus. This is what we're, we're in, very explosive time. Now, when the Wasser uprising took place, I was caught with my pants down. Don't, he don't like to say that because he's telling me that he don't want to see that that image. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. But I didn't, I didn't understand what was going on. So this thing happened, everybody just, I just started trailing the events. I mean, we were just involved with what was going on at the time. You had the so-called revolutionaries that had been, I had been attending study circles together with. You couldn't find them. It was the Amen sisters on the corner, you know, uh, directing traffic and so on and so forth. Things turned upside down during that whole period. But it was a period that was, that, it, that was very explosive, and it was a period that we can expect that th those conditions can give rise to it. You can bet your bottom dollar that the powers that be, at the Pentagons and political police, other government officials, they studied that period. They studied the 60s. They understand it. Huh? They were preparing, and they're, they're thinking in terms of those conditions returning, but on a much more much more explosive, much larger and global level that they, they are discussing. You've got to read these guys. Read their papers. They're concerned. The Pentagon has already done, it put, uh, invested in million dollar studies to, to anticipating urban uprisings throughout this country and throughout the world. They're getting ready. We are asleep, you know, and, we sh and, the, and the lesson from the 60s is don't get caught with your pants down. Begin to understand what we're dealing with and begin to coagulate our understanding in terms of what we're up against and what we're dealing with. I'm going to end my comments on three critical questions that I come to, to, to appreciate a little bit more, and we can debate this, but that I think we have to come to terms with. Uh, and that that experience and reflecting on that experience, I'm having to, 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 to understand much uh, deeper. One is the question of class. What is the class? Here, they, you got the middle class, the upper class, this class, huh? lower class, no class, every class. What is the relationships of class relationship that we exist? 
because there is a class reality. And the Watts uprising clarified that in many respects. Because like I said earlier, Baldwin Hills didn't erupt. When you talk about the eruption that took place throughout the country, it was, it was the working class communities that erupted. Huh? It wasn't the, the, uh, uh, the upper, class, uh, upper class blacks. What's more, the whole civil rights movement was, was proven limited mm -hmm. by the mass uprising of the bottom of the black community. They didn't get as much out of the civil rights movement as the upper classes in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in Wall Street got the most out of the civil rights movement. Although the civil rights movement was an advancement in history, still they were able to isolate the W.D. Boys, the Paul Robeson, the black, the black uh, veterans, the Negro Labor Council went out of existence. All these groupings that, that could, could have taken this thing in a much deeper directions, they were isolated. And so it was shaped in a way that the black masses didn't get as much out of the civil rights movement as the upper classes. Huh? So it, these class relationships were, were exposed. And when, as I'm studying, I see more and more how those class relationships have to be really understood if we're going to go forward. Because the fact of the matter is, is that we, do, we live in a class society. And therefore, uh, understanding the class relationships and the fact that we do have a ruling class that, that benefit, we have a 1% that benefit. And they benefit because of this class relationship that is, uh, is, uh, uh, is described as a capitalistic exploited system. The second uh, issue, uh, question I think is critical, is the question of, well, let me say this around the uh, class question. And um, this is part of the next question, that's the question of race, which is a critical question in American culture and history. Because of the question of of his, because of the, the color or racial factor in our thinking that's deep embedded in our, our society and structurally uh, embedded in, our, in our, our society, I could not move in the direction of Marxism by going directly to that white man called Karl Marx. I didn't. I had to go. I, I went through, I got introduced to, uh, uh, to Mao by Malcolm X. In his message to the grassroots, he talked about Mayo, and that there are no more Uncle Toms in China. That got me. And he talked about, uh, Malcolm talked about uh, the house Negro and the field Negro. He says, I'm a field Negro. And I said, I'm from Watts. I'm a field Negro. There was a class consciousness that he imparted. And by introducing me to Mao, I wanted to read more of what Mao did, because he got rid of all the Uncle Toms in China. There's a lot of people in China. So I read Mao. Mao introduced me to that white guy called Marx. That's because the color factor is so deep, I had to go that way. I couldn't go directly. There was a time when I didn't wear white underwears. I wore black underwears. I, I didn't like white folks. I mean, that's, that's where I was coming from. But I, had, I went through this period of, of, the, of the uprising, went through all the experience I went through in the study and so forth, and then I... I I joined a revolutionary study group that recruited me into a group called the Communist League. They eventually became the Communist Labor Party. I was there, uh, the education director of that group, studying Marxism and Leninism for revolutionaries during that period. Uh, I was the director of that, that committee. Uh, then I became part of the work around homeless organizing and welfare organizing within that, that division of labor. But that's my history. But I, I said that to talk about this color factor, which is very deep. There's no way in this country, in my, my conclusion, we can debate it, that you can understand the class question unless you understand the race question. But there's no way you can understand the race question unless you understand the class question. It's, these things are so inseparable. You can't, it's not a seesaw relationship between the two. Now it's race, now it's this, and which is what, and you're leaving it out and stuff like that. You cannot grasp class in this country unless you understand the racial the race factor in terms of how it evolves, like Max was talking about, in terms of the, the uh, uh, slaughter of the, the Native American Indians, you know, the, uh, uh, the attacks on the African, African continent in terms of slavery and so forth and so on and, and so forth. But it's important to, to understand how the ruling class have been able to move this question of race in relationship to their class position. Historically, no, ru no ruling class is ever, ever oppressed and exploited equally. 
They'd be stupid to do that. There's always a disproportion of attacks. So when we got into this oppressive Olympics, who's the most oppressed and who's not, the blacks and the whites and the Chicanos and so forth and so on, it was a way that it was a, a discussion that they prom uh, 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 promoted that allows us to, to turn inward on ourselves and not against them. We didn't see the man behind the curtain because we were so busy arguing with each other and turned against each other. Historically, that's how the ruling classes historically has had to, to, uh, uh, to, to put function. They never explored and oppressed equal. Even in the Roman society, you had Romanized uh, 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 captured nation, and you had none, some that was not Romanized. They found a way to emphasize differences and to cover up what we had in common. And this is a very important question in terms of how race has been used in a society. You look at the uh, anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany, which Nazi Germany borrowed off our racial system in terms of implementing it there in Nazi Germany. The question of race has just as much to do with the control of white, the white masses as it has to do with the isolation and attack against the non-whites. But the way the discussion happens is that you only, we only see it in terms of the racial oppression of, of, the, uh, uh, of the racially oppressed minorities. But we don't see that the problem of anti-Semitism was how do you get the, the uh, masses of the German workers to go to, to accept exploitation, to go and fight and die for the Krupps, the Thyssen, the upper class of the Germans. And that, that the anti-Semitism was about how you use the isolation and attack and even Holocaust against the Jews in order to control the white masses, to get them to do what the ruling class want to do. The same thing with race today, if you look at the history. The history is all about how you control the white masses as well as how you isolate. That's what happened after the Watts uprising and all the uprisings in the, uh, in the ghettos throughout the country, the Kerner Commission uh, uh, defined the whole problem as being just simply a question of race, although that was involved, certainly was involved. But it was more than that. They said it's just it's a problem of two nations, a white nation and a black nation. And it was covering up the fact that you had unemployment and, and other questions that was involved. But they did that as, so as to create a white, all white, all class backlash, you know, later on become the moral movement. Ronald Reagan was able to, to get elected to the governorship on the basis of the attack against those black criminals, you know, in Watts. They were able to use the color question. To, to, to elevate themselves and use the color question not only to attack and oppress the, the poor, the, the, uh, the impoverished uh, people of color, but also uh, to, to control the white masses, to get them to do what they want them to do. In that sense, they were able to put, coagulate them into an all-white, all-class unity to carry out the policies that they, they eventually call out. I want to put that out on the table because this, this solid South is, is a, has been the bastion of that relationship, this all class with the poor whites and poor and rich whites and middle class whites in terms of income uniting as a force, a reactionary force that we're having to still deal with today. So this race question was another question that I think was key. Then the last question, and I'll shut up after this, uh, is, is the question of the state and how the system is kept intact and trying to understand the state and how it operates, because every movement that's been successful in terms of reconstruction or revolution has been able to successfully exchange power relationship, and that the center of power is this control of the state apparatus, this apparatus of violence, and uh, the civil bureaucracy that, that managed that process. And we, uh, in, in Watts, understood that we had to go up against the Army and the National Guard if we were going to get any change, but we know that we were able, they were successfully able to isolate us and to, to, to bring in bigger forces that no way we were organized to deal with. This question of the state is very important if you're talking about change in society. This is Marxism, very basic on this question. Now, the, of course, there's an apparatus of violence in terms of the military, the police, ICE, all these things, which we tend to see as separate Thing. There's ICE over here, there's the LA police attacking blacks over there, there's the military bases all over the world. This is the US state apparatus that, is, that the same one that's attacking the Venezuela is the same one that's attacking the homeless in these camp, encampments all over the country. Huh? It's the same forces that we're dealing with that are attacking the immigrants. We gotta understand the state apparatus. Now the state apparatus, when you look at it, 
it is upheld by an officer corps that's necessary middle class. Huh? Uh, many years ago, well, 2,000 years ago, Aristotle, and it's quoted by some of the big uh, uh, political strategies today, they quote on how, quote him in his statement that the larger your middle class, I'm paraphrasing, the more stable your society is. Mm -hmm. huh? The weak, uh, the, if your middle class diminish, that puts you in a difficult position. There's no way that 1%, which has been the proportion, basically, of a ruling class, can control, control the rest of us unless they have this middle strata consolidated. Huh? A lot of this gentrification today is about consolidating a certain sector uh, because that sector is what constitutes the officer core of your military, of your police, you, of your civil bureaucracy on every level. And this crisis of 2008, as a result of this tremendous technological development that, you know, that uh, Wasteline was, is uh, raised, uh, is, has, is diminishing this middle strata. And that's a very weak point. During that period, during the Watts uprising, during the 60s, you still had a standard of living of the middle strata that was increasing. It was pretty stable. Uh, but today, these times, that is Gone. It's weakening. Yeah. In Detroit, when the 2008 crisis hit, the police force uh, closed their, their doors at 4 o'clock. The ruling class couldn't have no police force close their door at 4 o'clock. Huh? They had to try to figure out a way to get out of that crisis to deal with this, this middle strata to consolidate their position. So this question of state, I'm just offering, that I learned from this process of having gone up against the state, is to understand that the state is what it is and how it's made up in the social strata that, they, that the enemy depends on in order to, uh, to control us and keep us intact. In People hear what I'm trying to get at? Okay, I, I know... My name is Baptist, and I have a propensity to preach. You're lucky I ain't standing up, because I'll be up here doing, doing all this to y'all. But uh, uh, thanks for listening. Okay. And the last thing is that I really love Max Elbon's book. Uh, the most important thing I love about his book is his title, Revolution in the Air. Yeah. Because I think revolution in the air describes more our situation today than that situation because the tremendous fundamental changes Change. that the society yes. is going through. Yes. And we got to get ready. We yes. want to be caught like waistline with our <laughs> pants down. <laughs> so I'll stop there. So uh, are you going to moderate, or we should just call on whoever? Uh. I think if you have a question, if you have a question, I'll pass you the mic. Hi. So I was just extremely moved by all of you guys. Just uh, learned a lot, and um, I wanted to ask you something about where we are today. And mm -hmm. I don't want to overemphasize or over fetishize or under fetishize electoral politics, yeah. but, you know, we turn on the television and we're in the midst of this electoral uh, yeah, stuff. <laughs> and um, Max, you mentioned about the uh, 60s and how it was so important that LBJ stepped down, but electorally then he got, you know, um, Nixon was brought to us and... Uh, he led um, a movement that was very destructive. So where are we at this moment today in terms of how we as underlying social forces in this country, where are we in terms of our participation and our support of certain social democratic electoral forces out there. And I'd like to ask what kind of importance you feel, if there is any, that in that. 
Well, I'll, I'll toss up my opinion, and we'll see what everybody's opinion is. Um, people, the masses of people first grab onto the levers that seem to be available to them to make change. And as far as I can tell, those who are most committed among thousands and millions of people of trying to make social change have thrown themselves into the electoral arena because they saw that Trump took power via an election and because they see the change that Bernie Sanders made in people's thinking through his electoral campaign. So millions of people, and because the electoral arena still exists as a legitimized form, the most dedicated people um, are using the electoral arena. And I think we have to be there, and I think we have to advocate a vote to defeat Trump in 2020. Uh, we are not indifferent to the fact that the Trump coalition is a different coalition than the coalition, even the corporate democratic coalition. The question will be then, with that perspective, I, I think what's the point that both uh, Waistline and Willie made is that uh, the economics are very different from the 1960s. Mm -hmm. we're, in an, uh, a, we're in a situation where even the defeat of Trump mm. will not immediately solve everybody's problem who wants change. And how fast that will translate into further motion, I think that remains to be seen. But I don't think it's possible to uh, boycott or uh, cede the electoral terrain to the enemy. The voting rights struggle was a crucial struggle for our generation, both because it did actually empower people in many situations to make certain changes against the kind of repressive forces, certain sheriffs in certain localities, Harold Washington in mm -hmm. Chicago, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm but also because it symbolizes one person, one vote democracy and a whole range of democratic rights and citizenship rights that need to be extended to the whole population. So the fight for electoral reform, the fight for felony reenfranchisement, all these are bound up with the questions of uh, electoral struggle. And Marx uh, talked about winning the battle for democracy. The road to socialism lies through the battle for democracy. Um, I think it's n not predictable how fast the struggle will proceed in the wake of the defeat of Donald Trump, uh, of what kind of exact balance will be between further motion in the streets and in the labor movement and so on and the electoral arena, but I think we have to be involved in the electoral arena, both as a matter of harm reduction and as a matter of protecting the most vulnerable and as a matter of building the left to scale to the point where we can speak to millions and, like Waistline said, affect the way the whole country is thinking. If we abstain from that arena, we leave it uh, to other forces. Mm -hmm. That's my point of view. On that, uh, I'd like to weigh in a little bit on it. I uh, absolutely agree. I live back in Detroit. I live in the district that elected Rashida to live, right? That's the district I live in. Now, in Detroit, we got to a point where we could run communist for office. By that, I mean our billboard said, vote communist. I kid you not. I mean, you know, which was outrageous, but we didn't know how outrageous it was back in, we, we, we really didn't. Back in 76, uh, we ran a judge for office, and he won. The next day, the newspaper said, the judge is a Marxist, you know. So I'm, I'm saying that if we look at and address ourselves to the people who vote, not, you don't address the people who don't vote. But if you address yourself to the people that vote, 
then you can develop a strategy and approach to how you want to deal with the electoral politics and stuff. I think it's very important we be involved in it. It's also important we be involved with people who are never going to vote. Now, my last point is that about a month ago, on my Facebook page, Daryl Mitchell, friend me, you know, I started running a little ad that said, anybody but Joe. And I meant anybody but Joe Biden. And I started running that because an election is like a system of events. During the preliminary stage of it, everyone is jockeying to see who make it through the primary. So I ran anybody but Joe. Last week I added anybody but Joe and Corey, right? Because he stood up and said he'd cut his arm off for Israel. I'm like, okay, put Corey next, you know. Okay. No, I'm seriously like, some of this is we're going to figure out what to do on some of it. But yes, we have to be involved on every front. Those who don't believe in it, cool, we got other assignments for you, you know. I, I, I wanted to emphasize just again, it has to do with some understanding of, of the power relationships in this country. You know, Malcolm once said that the only thing that power addresses is people with more power, you know, and that the center of power has to do with the state apparatus, and the electoral process has a, a role to play in the way the state apparatus and the ruling class controls us, okay? I think there has to be a fundamental understanding of, of the role of elections in a bourgeois capitalist society. On the other hand, the lesson that I've learned throughout the year is that Mohammed has to go to the mountain because the mountain never comes to Mohammed. And the mountain is the people, right? You gotta go where people are at, not where they ain't at. You don't go where you're at, you go where they're, they're at. And you gotta proceed from that and use that experience to educate and to organize. That's the main thing. How do we unite the bottom? Which is clearly the powers that be don't want you to do that. They'll say, Green New Deal, this progressive, that progressive. I remember uh, Jesse Jackson, which some of y'all like Jesse Jackson, I, I, you know, forgive me, but I, I lived in Chicago. <laughs> and I know what he, what he rep represent. Well, you know, we was organizing the homeless union. We organized in some 25 local <coughs> states, like I, I think I mentioned earlier. Uh, and we were very militant. We had come forward with our demands, like homeless, not helpless, uh, no housing, no peace. You know, you're only one paycheck away from homelessness and stuff. And he would adopt our, adopt our uh, slogans because he knew that we weren't organized enough to hold him accountable. You know, and so the question here is where do power come from? Did it come strictly through the electoral process or it come from the actual organization of the people who are involved? And therefore, our approach to the election process is since people are there, how do you use that to organize? Not as an answer. Now, some people are talking socialism and so on. They're thinking that you can get socialism through the electoral process. You can't get it through that. You got to get it through the unity and organization of the people at the bottom who has every interest to change the system. They're hurting from it. And so the election process becomes how do you, what is the use of it in terms of organizing the bottom? If you don't do that, then you're just playing into the whole problem. So that, that's the task. We, we organized the Homeless Union just recently in Salinas. And the president of the Salinas Homeless Union, Wes White, had become known as the advocate around homelessness. We had shifted away from what we call poverty pimps. They were the ones that said we were concerned about, crying, uh, about the homeless, and they cried a lot of crocodile tears and, and said, bring that money, you know, the funding, right? He was able to, in the effort of the struggle against the attacks on encampments in Salinas, was able to organize this, uh, the homeless there and develop a certain notoriety. He, f he put in his uh, application to run for the, uh, uh, the, uh, the council position. They didn't allow him to run at that time because they said he didn't have an address because he was homeless. That was fought out afterwards, after the election, about he's a citizen, he should have a right to run. So this time around, he ran for mayor of Salinas, and he got put on the ballot. Huh? That at a certain point in that campaign, he threw his support for another 
another person, another candidate, because he took up the same issue while he wanted to spend more time in organizing and consolidating the, the homeless community. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. When the election came through, people know West White in Salinas. The election came through, despite the fact that he withdrew his, his candidacy, they, they voted, and this is a small, relatively small town, they voted and gave, they voted for him anyway. 7,000 votes came in for this homeless guy. What that expressed was the ability to build relationships and organizations in, in, in community and neighborhood that he was building in that process. It was a measure of to, to what extent that the homeless union in the struggle against homelessness and all the other problems associated with homelessness was able to gather around them these relationships. Yeah. It's so important that we approach the election for what it is and also approach it from the standpoint of how we can use these various arenas, including the electoral arena, to, to organize. And when you study revolutions or any successful social movement, it's very important to study how they have used the, red, uh, the uh, electoral process and how effective they are, and then we can use that to, to, to give guidance to our work. So this electoral process is a very important area. To get away from it is to get away from the people. And it's the people that's going to move things. So we got to have a relationship that, that is constructive, and that is organization, organization, organization. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your experiences today and for actually fighting for uh, the, the uh, example of the struggle. It's very powerful and concretely. I'm trying to think of what I really want to ask, so sorry, it's a little convoluted. <laughs> you know, when I think about this idea of revolution in the air, you know, I'm a, a generation after maybe, so I'm a child of the, the 70s and 80s, and I think about the things that really formed me, right? So. It's like I didn't really have an option to not understand about U.S. imperialism in Central America because that's what dominated like mm -hmm. my politics, right? Yeah, what, yeah. what is Ronald Reagan all about? So I'm thinking like of a moment where you have you spoke about like it's explosive now, yeah. but the conditions that are different to me is we aren't in an industrial moment, right? Yeah. The people working in Silicon Valley aren't the same people working no, right. in Detroit, right? We aren't in a colonial moment in the same way right. where you're going to figuring out like, well, what's going on down there, right, in Mozambique or what's going on in that I have to understand how do I decode the world that I live in, right? So, and then what are those people studying? Who are they drawing from? Right. So like I think of all these like moments that allow for consciousness building, right? The Vietnam War, uh -huh. right? The point you raised, Max, of like every day you're seeing this and you're trying to understand like what is this country, you know, doing to this other country, who are they fighting back, and what do these people believe, right? So I'm just think, sitting here thinking about if you're, you know, in your 20s or 30s now, what do you guys think in terms of, uh, you know, apart from questions of like lack of organization and power on the ground, like where do we draw from in terms of international struggles to think about like this could be a guiding light or a sparking point to be like, understanding how people maybe, uh, sorry, if I'm not really forming it well, no, but I'm, I'm trying, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, you think about how in the moment in which you guys became politicized, all those things happening, the importance of what was going on in the glo global south, right? Is there anything like that we can draw from today mm -hmm. to think about how to build for our next step? Maybe. Okay, um, I was in a meeting in the Bay. Uh, that's, I'm from Oakland, I live in Oakland now. Uh, and there were people there, it, it was a meeting uh, associated with an education project, uh, not as uh, beautiful and as professional as this, but there is an alternative left Marxist-oriented school there, and it was the community around that school, which includes a lot of people from India, Brazil, people who are working around Palestine and the Arab, Arab Resource Organizing Committee. And uh, there was a long discussion about Duterte in the Philippines, Orban in Hungary, Trump in the United States, Netanyahu in Israel, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India. And the point got made that we need to get rid of one and start a ripple effect. And that getting rid of one 
somebody winning a victory, a people's power victory over that, mm -hmm. will resonate around the globe. And I think that's uh, where the most hope lies in terms of turning this around. I mean, right-wing authoritarianism has the initiative globally. It's not, there's the, the complicated interrelationship between the crisis of the global capitalist model and which forces were able to move in and take advantage of that crisis was not to the left's advantage. So what happened was, as the transitions from an industrial economy and a growing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the neoliberal model ran out of steam, the right was better positioned to move in there with its narrative than the left mm. globally. Partly because it was better resourced, partly because, like Willie said, they studied the 60s, they knew what they wanted to do next time, mm -hmm. and they have more money and they have more guns. Uh, and the 20th century upsurge for socialism suffered some, def was defeated. I mean, not all defeated and not everything was, I mean, there was a lot of progress, but we were eventually thrown back. So, um, they hold the initiative, but it's fragile because they are unable uh, to deliver the goods to their social base. It's more and more based upon yeah. hatred and scapegoating yeah. and whipping up. Uh, this is why you see the rise of the conspiracy theory situation, why you see the rise in the most irrationality. People have talked about that the right wing is not just making war on the left and on the masses, but on science, on truth. Yes because there's a whole shift away from anything connected to objective reality into pure hate, which allows, like Willie said, that's a vulnerable point for them because yes. a number yes. of points, people who have gone that way have gone that way, not because they believe all this stuff, because but they're hurting and these were the yeah. political forces there and so they're going that way. So we've got to move the cycle the other direction. And uh, I, I'm not taking bets on which authoritarian right-wing racist might be the most vulnerable. Uh, actually, I think the chances of getting rid of Trump are probably as good right now as getting rid of Duterte, Orban, uh, Netanyahu, Bolsonaro. I mean, we are in a situation where we, the erosion of certain democratic rights is, for all the problems here, not as severe as in some of the other countries. So we can start a new cycle. Um, that's where I think can be happening. And if that happens, you know, the, the global South is tremendously volatile, as has been made. People are moving. Climate change is devastating. Countries all over half Africa is on the move. I mean, people are yeah. moving around. And what's happening now in Sudan, uh, Algeria, these things can ripple. A quickie. Um, I want to attack it a little bit different because we're at a different moment in history. You know, today everyone is roughly 30 to 40 seconds away from everybody else on earth. So we have to talk about internationalism in a different way. By that I mean like we experience in a unique moment in human history. For the last 5,000 years, development on earth meant that the more advanced areas on Earth, Mesopotamia, Sumerian society, the more advanced areas on Earth, they would colonize and organize the people in the outlying area and bring them into their own economic, social, and political order as a form of development. Now it's moving it out the way for him. Y'all see that? I moved it out the way for him and I knocked it over. But we reach in this moment in history where this colonial curve has expended itself, right? What we're dealing with is something fundamentally different than what we was dealing with 100 years ago. When Willie talk about things like the color question and race, we're essentially talking about a question of colonialism. That is somebody bring you into their economic and political order. Yes, it's brutal, but the fact of the matter is that that's how development took place on Earth. And I mention it because we can talk about internationalism in a different way. We're starting to learn how to communicate with each other in real time. So we're getting ready to experience a different kind of work, a different kind of proletarian movement. Everybody know what the word proletarian means? 
for those who don't know, the word proletarian means a group of people who have no other way to live except by selling their labor power, their labor ability. Now, it gets nasty when nobody needs your labor ability because then you can't make a living. But the point is, I think we're getting ready to do something different, and I'm not sure what, but the colonial curve of history has completed itself. And we're talking about a world that's going to develop where we'll be able to stand up as one internationally. That wasn't possible at the beginning of the last century. It, it just couldn't happen. Just, just one other element. I think, in the, I think the study of the Panthers experience, I, I don't think that they were labeled the number one internal uh, threat to national security for nothing. And they were destroyed because some of the work that they did was very effective. And uh, they were able to somehow it, it involve black youth in a political education process, you know, that connected the immediate issues that they are facing with the international issue. They did it very effectively, and I think we should study that. I mean, you look at the Black Panthers newspaper and see through art how they was able to do it. I think some of your questions are tactical, you know, but I, I, I think the problem is, is how do we take the issues that are moving people and, and carry out the kind of political education that connected to the problems that's going on. Like, for example, one of the, the main points of agitation of our work organizing the homeless today is the fact that these encampments that homeless folks are having to go into are being attacked by the same state that the others that is attacking Venezuela. Yeah. You know, it's become an educational point where you can raise that kind of political consciousness. I thought the Panthers was very effective in that, and it was so effective, that's why they, they was attacked. But I, I think we can draw from history some of those tactical questions that we can use to try to resolve this, this question in the context of these times, because it is a different time. We're not talking about newspaper. We're talking about you know cell phones and all kinds of other stuff that we need to think in terms of how to, how to deal with. But I think the other aspect of it is the forces that we're arguing against that tries to just isolate these questions. We're dealing with a very sophisticated enemy who knows counterinsurgency. They try to separate these issues. They can tell the they can try to convince the American people that they're they're doing humanitarian work in Venezuela, right, with the bringing of the food, and yet homelessness is growing by leaps and bounds here, and somehow people don't see the connection. That how in the hell are you gonna be humanitarian if you got people who are freezing to death every year because they don't have a house, or that the water is poison, and these kinds of questions. If you're such a humanitarian. You know, why are these questions right in the richest country in the world happening? There need to be a political education process that t connect these issues. Because right now we only see the disconnection and we don't get nothing from the media. Uh, and certainly the powers that be are making sure that we don't get the kind of consciousness that's going to, you know, be able to throw us into a motion that's going to be effective. So looking at some of the past experiences, I, I find that the Panthers experience very fascinating because they were able to position themselves within the areas that erupted, and they positioned themselves among the people that erupted, and they were able to absorb a tremendous growth and influence as a result of that. I think identifying certain forces within our country, and I, I think that I would, I would propose that, that the forces that we're dealing with is the poor and dispossessed who have no, no interest in the status quo. They're, they're the people that has to fight, and they're beginning to fight. It's not in the news media, but it's happening. And I think they, they embodied all the major issues, the militarism, the racism, the class relationships, the ecology, they are the worst hit by the crises. They, you can't disconnect these questions in their lives because they, they're affected by all of it. So uniting them helped facilitate the unity of these questions. You know? And so I think these are some of the considerations that I would make you know, in answer to your question, you know, and look at some of the lessons from history that we can learn from. Hi, thank you all for your contributions to the struggles. Um, du Bois was mentioned earlier, and I just happened to be in the middle of Adolph Reed Jr.'s book on Bois' um, uh, political philosophy. And in one of the chapters, he relies heavily on James Burkhardt Gilbert's book on the formation of industrial societies, where he draws a really provocative through line 
of a variant of collectivist assumption that runs all the way from Booker T. Washington and Du Bois' debates through to technocratic liberals all the way to the Soviets. And that assumption is of elite leadership. And when I was um, thumbing through the appendix of the parties at the end of the book, I noticed that a lot of them were uh, Leninist Marxist parties. And on current reflection of the uh, incredible failures of technocratic liberalism and the Soviets losing power, I wondered for nascent communist organizations, what lessons have you learned about different leadership models and um, what are your current thoughts on, on leadership uh, design? Um, I think that uh, most of the revolutions in the 20th century and those movements uh, for various reasons ended up in a military, in a principally military situation. In the Russian Revolution, which was the one that was not principally military in the revolution itself, the Civil War immediately afterwards, the invasions from other countries, uh, stamped it with a, a, a military model, a single one-party state, iron discipline to win the war against the white terror. And the national liberation movements, which were the wellspring of all the other revolutions um, that were able to retain state power for any length of time, uh, had to fight a military struggle against uh, the colonial power. Um, the experiments uh, that tried to win power through a combination of mass action and electoral action and with a more um, what in what would be called, at least on the surface, a more democratic approach. Chile is the most common example, uh, was overthrown in a coup, and that then was still born because of that. So the models that took place were constrained by those factors, and it built in a kind of military approach, which is top-down, centralized, and has to be that under those kinds of conditions. I think, uh, my own opinion, there was a high cost for that, and to the extent a virtue was made of that necessity, and that was held up as an advanced model, as opposed to as a response to particular historical conditions that may have had some positive, that had some reasons. It wasn't just because all these revolutionaries were power mad and wanted to run something technocratic. Um, I think it, it ended up uh, producing a lot of problems for groups that tried to emulate that under conditions that had nothing similar to that. Combined with the internet, the technological revolution, and just a greater sensitivity to participatory and bottom-up kind of situations, I think our future models, to the extent possible, have to be in that direction. Um, and you need overwhelming numbers and really the power to uh, try to keep things on a level of struggle. The, the left's point of view, I think, is always the most peaceful, non-military struggle possible. But it's not completely under our control. So situations may arise mm -hmm. where we are forced, or sections of us are forced again to deal in a situation that requires situations where democracy and bottom-up initiative is, gets constrained. So I think this is a really complicated question. You've focused a lot on the philosophical side, which I think is one dimension of it. But I think it, you know, pairing it with the dimension of what conditions we face. One of the advantages we have in the United States today is we can have a meeting like this. We're not really worried that the police are gonna come in the door. If this was the West Bank, or if this was uh, apparently a school in Brazil right now, um, if this was in Hungary, if this was at the university in Manila, it would be a different situation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's good to hear you, and thanks for talking about Detroit. All that history is starting to surface like it should because uh, that particular activity was kind of, uh, I don't want to make assumptions, but not as heard 
not that it's, you know, that's what it's about, but uh, in reference to that, what was the contribution of the, uh, the Henry brothers in the Republic of New Africa? What was uh, the origins of that evolution uh, since you're uh, focused on uh, Detroit? Again, 1968 was a big year. Uh, the RNA, Republic of New Africa, it was formed in 1968. And inter it's interesting because the program of the Republic of New Africa, and you're talking about Milton Henry. Okay, the Henry, yeah, yeah. The program of the RNA was for a homeland in the South for blacks. Actually, the one, people who pioneered that was the Communist International. They pioneered this concept that the world, and they were correct in my view, that the world consists of these imperial centers of powers and colonies. That is to say, people who had been colonized and brought into the economic political order you know, of uh, the colonizing country. And RNA looked at the South like that. And to this day, the South is the most depressed area of America. Now, in the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, we always had good fraternal relations with the RNA. In fact, uh, my memory is, it skips back and forth, but um, in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, Chalkway Lumumba, yeah, he passed and his son won. Chalkway was initially one of the leaders of the RNA. But the point is, we always had fraternal relations with them. Very good, but we were not them. We were a League of Revolutionary Black Workers. We could have named ourselves League of Revolutionary Black People, but we didn't. We named ourselves League of Revolutionary Black Workers because it was a moment in history where we understood who we were from a class point of view. We were industrial factory workers with a different orientation and perspective. But you know, you had uh, the RNA, who else you had? Uh, what was peculiar was you had two Freedom Now parties that was formed in America. The Mississippi Freedom Now Party, and in Michigan you had the Michigan Freedom Now Party. Just those two. In Michigan, the Freedom Now Party was able to get on the ballot and run candidates. So we had a superior form of organization. But uh, yeah, I don't think a group like the RNA can exist as such anymore nor can a group like the League of Revolutionary Black Workers be reformed, because that's a moment in history that's gone. The role of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers was to dismantle the last bastion of segregation. And at the point that began to fall, it became untenable for us to talk about just black workers. It, we just couldn't, we could no longer go any for, further on that basis. So at first, a section of the group started talking about forming a black Marxist Leninist party as a platform to form a general party. That got thrown out and we became part of uh, the Nelson, I call it the Nelson Perry group because he was a central figure in it. But uh, the group that Willie was involved yeah, yeah. in, we joined around 71, I believe it was, yeah, yeah, 72, yeah, you know. But those kind of movements, I don't think like can happen again as such. But yeah, we, I mean, everybody was there, the Nation of Islam. It was formed in Detroit, right? The Nation of Islam was formed in Detroit. So Detroit has all this history that made it possible to or organize and do things. Wasn't Chicago? No, it wasn't Chicago. And it's amazing. That's where it, their, their office is. That's where their office there. is. But it was formed in Detroit by uh, Elijah Poole, who became them, T-H-E-M, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You know, yes. And it's interesting because the Nation of Islam adopted the old common term program written in 1928. Now, what had actually happened was you had uh, this, it's, it's, she's called a mother queen, I forget her name. She was the one who informed people in the Nation of Islam and the RNA about, say it again? Yes, yes. She taught the common term doctrine because you had a mass of blacks who was really members of the uh, old Communist Party. Uh, super quick and I'm through. In America, I mean, we're funny people, right? Most of us don't like to join organizations, but we are quick to accept 
the sectarian view and ideology of an organization, and we will argue to death based on the organization without joining it, right? Since that's how we are, no, that's how we are. We, I mean, we like, you know, I mean, we are, that's how we are. Since, well, in, 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 in the country, we, we formed what, the Know Nothing Party? Oh, Know Nothing. Yeah. How you form a political party that brags about you knowing nothing? <laughs> no, I'm quite serious. We have this peculiarity, and we need to catch up with it because it's who we are, and that's all right. But we have to learn how to educate people in a way knowing that they will become part of your network without necessarily becoming a member of the organization, because that's just how we are. I just, one thing I just want to say on an early question, somebody raised uh, W. Du Bois, uh, I think, uh, classic, you know, Black Reconstruction. I really want to encourage people to study that document, straight up, because I think it's one of the most important documents about the history of this country. At a very, he's discussing Black, Black Reconstruction, what did I say? Black Reconstruction, yeah. called Black Reconstruction. And in there, one of the main lessons they talk about is the missed moment. That at a certain juncture in American history, there was an opportunity of the labor movement to appreciate the struggles that was happening in the South, coming out of slavery, but that was not appreciated. And thus, they missed the moment. Yeah. And he talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat, white, black, brown, yellow. He was talking about the opportunity to do that. So missing that opportunity, Wall Street was able to take the place of the slave power. And I think it's a, a lot of lessons there in terms of the moment. What is the moment and how we, uh, we organize for it? I think our moment is defined by this tremendous, unprecedented technological revolution that's taken place in our country. And it's having an uh, effect that, that is still, still happening in terms of what's going on. And we've got to understand this moment. Uh, I, like I was saying, that the uh, uh, this uh, lady by, that's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, which is one of the most powerful organizations in the whole network of of folks that have run the country, you know, for the last 70 years, and she is now the head of the New America, thing. and she, in one of her comments, says, "I'm afraid that what's happening and what Trump is reacting to in terms of the conditions are such that we're moving toward the 30s." I'm afraid that the 30s is what we're moving for. And I think it's a very important point to take note in terms of what they're looking at, in terms of what was that moment and what we're dealing with. The 30s, unlike the, six, the uh, 60s, where you had the national liberation movements taking place in the global south, you had the movements against, for, against uh, inequality inside the countries and so forth, and those being attacked, being the, taking the brunt of the attack of the capitalist system at, at that time, and they erupted in their activities. In the 30s, you had a much widespread uh, uh, development where the largest tech, uh, general strike in American history is the textile general strike in, in the South. And then you had the general strike in, in uh, the San Francisco area and Minneapolis. And you had all kinds of bonus march. You had a tremendous outpouring of, 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 of the masses of people as a result of the industrial mass production at that time that gave rise to this tremendous depression and outbreak. What is our moment? Are we reliving, are we in a moment that is indeed explosive where revolution is in the air? If that's the case, we don't want to miss that moment. Yeah. Huh? That means we want to learn from each other. We want to have more of these discussions. This shouldn't be an exception. This should be something that we do in life. You know, for life. And I, I just want to say that, especially in relationship to this, this uh, magnus opus of W. Du Bois, because people usually just look at uh, Talk, when you say W. Du Bois, you think in terms of uh, 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 the souls of black folks. You know, he went through a trajectory. When he got to that point, he studied Marxism. He studied, used it as a, uh, as a prison to analyze the economic and social situation. And he came up with this beautiful uh, text that I know we're studying it, but I really encourage people to study W. Du Bois. It wasn't for nothing that the political police moved to isolate him from the civil rights movement because of what he the direction that he was going to impart on that process that the black ministers didn't do. So I, 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 would, I would just make that point, and the point around this moment is, is the point that I, is just building on. Do you agree what, with what he said about the talented 10? 
No, I think, I mean, he changed his view on that. I mean, he, for a while there, early on, he was talking about a certain sector of the Negro people, which was the intellectuals should be elite. But toward the, toward the end, he began to appreciate the role of the, of the working class in a very clear way. And certainly through that, that, uh, uh, that particular book, he was making that point. And that was in 35, around that period that he wrote the book. He began to see things in a much more, uh, uh, a different way than he seen it when, during the period of the uh, uh, souls of black folks. I mean, I, like, I, like I said, I started off didn't liking white folks. I didn't wear white underwears. I mean, I mean that's just, and we all go through that kind of trajectory. But he, he, he uh, elevated. And this book represents a certain high point in his, in his intellectual development. And I really highly recommend people to st not just read it, but to study it. A lot of lessons. I know there's still a lot of questions, but unfortunately, we're just about out of time. Um, Willie, Max, oh. and <laughs> Wayne. <Wayslan. laughs> oh. um, everyone, please get a copy of the book. And um, Willie, uh, Max, and Wasteland, do you have anything you would like to close with t this evening? I'd like to thank Max, man, for you know for you know creating a basis for a real important discussion that we need to have. A period, a very important period that shaped us, and to know that period is beginning to to comprehend what in the hell we're up against today so we can, we can win, not just fight the good fight. That's bullshit to me, fighting the good fight. We want, we try, <laughs> we're trying to kick ass, we're trying to win. <laughs> and uh, or else, what's the point, you know? Uh, so anyway, I, I want to thank my man Max, because he, he's uh, uh, provoked this kind of discussion and need to be provoked all over the place. Real quick, um, thank you. It's people like you that have sustained me in life. In September, I'll be 67 years old. I could not have got through life without the connections I had with people in the movement, you know, through my deepest sorrow moments to these high levels of exhilaration. Mm -hmm. It's comrades, it's brothers, it's yes. people I have established contact yes. with that made it possible for me to hold on to my sanity and things like that. I think that's important because our ruling class is degenerate. They're pessimistic. They have a very ugly view, and they are infecting the people with it. So it's, it's our collectivity that's going to make things possible and stuff. And I'm just saying, you know, let's stay together. Sound you know, like a but, song. You know, but, <laughs> let's stay together. Um, well, I guess my closing thoughts are about hope. So uh, Wasteline said something earlier about the conditions that we experienced in the 60s were the material basis for a kind of hope and optimism. Yeah. And um, I think the conditions that people face now, it is more difficult. We lived through victories, and we had the kind of what, what Wasteline said about the industrial society. Mark Nason has written about that in terms of the music of the period mm. uh, and what that, you know, people get ready and mm. um, yes. all of that. And there was just a material basis that infused us. I think it's harder now. Uh, the economic conditions for people are more difficult. The threat of climate change hovers over people. And I think also speaking of hope in an abstract way is not particularly helpful if it's too disconnected. Hmm. So I think what we need is realistic hope. Um, we are not going to go from where we are now in some easy, straight, quick line to the kind of future we want. I don't think it's realistic to promise people or to set our expectations that there's going to be a quick road to the socialist revolution. But I do think it is extremely realistic to think that the defeat of the authoritarian right can, riding this wave of the upsurge we have, put us in a position to be contenders for power in American mainstream society as the next stage. I think that is eminently realistic, achievable, 
and it would be a huge breakthrough. It would have international yes, yes. repercussions and Definitely. give hope and heart to people all over the globe, as well as changing some policies yes. that would provide more space. And I think it would position us, we won't know how fast, for another stage that will be more advanced. So I think there is a material basis for realistic hope that we can move the needle another notch. I'm, I'm not, don't want to promise anybody that we can move the needle all the way to the full side of the gas tank, which especially bad metaphor because we're going to get rid of fossil fuels, but I think we can move that needle. And I think part of the job of the people, those of us who were privileged to grow up infused and imprinted by that hope is to try to convey that in a realistic way to the next generations. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, he, 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 he